Um, I'm going to give a, a quick overview on uh, the process that we've used at Salem Community College to move courses quickly online. Um, if I could have the next slide, please. Um, as many of you over the last year and just about a year ago, I got noticed we had to move all our courses wholly online. Uh, Salem uh, is New Jersey's smallest community college, so we don't have quite the challenge that other colleges have. But we did have to uh, move our courses, every one, every course online on campus um, or hybrid had a Canvas course shell. So we had something online for the students when we had, again, to go wholly online last, uh, last spring. So the reason I did this presentation and put together the slides is really to talk about a process for uh, very quickly getting a course up and running that doesn't follow the typical course development process. If you wouldn't mind the next slide. So the next slide, it shows you typical course development process. Uh, the instructor is uh, already chosen, meets with the instructional designer. Uh, they talk about the course. They have a three to six month timeline. That's usually what's accepted as far as moving uh, a course online. And they work and develop the digital elements, the sequencing of the course, they test them, and then they, it's an iterative process, so they tend to go through it again. We had situations where we needed to get courses, particularly when it came to the fall semester, uh, online quickly in about four weeks, and sometimes less than that. If I could have the next slide. Kind of like this talk, this is kind of great. We're just gonna put this whole thing in a very short capsule here. So what can go wrong in terms of online course development if you don't have the instructor isn't in place until maybe three weeks before the course starts? That's a pretty good timeline sometimes for last minute additions with adjuncts. Um, the text isn't selected, the bookstore needs a listing, and there really is no time to build the traditional course elements. And I should point out, I'm the full-time LMS administrator. I'm also the instructional designer at Salem. I have a colleague who works half-time supporting uh, faculty and students in Canvas as well. We provide all our own support. So what did we do? Next slide, please. So what we decided to do, and we had done this um, previously bringing people on board, but we looked at what a publisher could bring um, to the process to speed it up, to get it down to weeks instead of months. So if you are familiar with publisher materials, um, if you're not, typically what a publisher can bring is they can bring a digital text, they can bring um, course materials that are available from the first day of class because it's integrated with your LMS. They already have set up usually practice assignments, homework assignments, other assessments. In many ways you can, in many instances, you can craft your own using their materials. Um, you also can get, um, uh, you can get this integrated with the LMS and you will have additional instructor resources, some to, usually, typically, um, that includes PowerPoints, it might include test banks, again, to craft your own versions of tests. In our case, we always start with the college syllabus that's approved by the college. So we have learning objectives in place that makes it easier to focus and decide on which um, publisher materials we have decided to use. So next slide, please. So what can go wrong? A lot can go wrong. A buzzkill for the beginning of the semester is when the bookstore lists one edition. And in fact, uh, the instructor uh, was not notified or I was not notified and they're using a prior edition. Um, sometimes the building block, the digital building block from the publisher isn't in your LMS. You can't do anything without that. Um, and sometimes uh, what happens, well, I, I, a difficult point is where the instructor is not familiar with the software product. And I'm gonna explain when I talk about the process we use, how to overcome that, or at least try to um, offset some of the um, deficits that an instructor not being familiar with a, a software product like a publisher product can run into. Next slide, please. Okay, so there's a process and a product, and that's what I'm gonna describe uh, very briefly to you. Next slide. Okay, so the important thing is to have a consistent process. We had to move basically 20 plus instructors um, online who had been teaching on campus, um, perhaps not um, the prior fall was the last time they taught. They came to fall of 2020, all of a sudden they're wholly online. So they're going to be online instructors, which is scary in its own right and requires its own support and development to, to be good at. 
Um, but they also needed materials that were in digital form uh, in order really to work uh, efficiently with students. So the first thing that we really try to do in terms of this process, and again, one that ideally you should allow between two and four weeks for if you have to get a course together, is introduce your uh, instructor to the rep. And the publisher rep can actually uh, help, your, help you quite a bit. Your publisher rep can do a number of things for you. We can review texts with them. Um, sometimes I usually attend those, those meetings that I set up. Um, a digital rep can, or a publisher's rep can also um, give you information on the different formats that are available. Sometimes there's a loose leaf format with it, as well as a, a typical access code that comes with it. Um, the rep will order the addition of the building block into your LMS so that you can actually integrate the materials into your course in your LMS. And we also relied upon our reps to put the requests where we would have observers added to a course to support students, usually through our disability support coordinator. We would have an observer assigned to a student in a course. That observer needs access to the same materials that the student is using. So the rep can um, put you in touch with the people that can, or they actually provide the license access for that observer. The rep usually also has an implementation team or specialist that they can refer you to. So you've made the initial introduction between the rep. You're going to turn around to the instructor and say, look, you have your instructor account now. Go through what we've decided on as far as the uh, text and the course material you're going to use. Have an idea of what you want to use. Sometimes I'll sit down and do that conversation, go over that conversation with them. And then what happens is um, they need a training session with the implementation specialist. Sometimes it is the rep who does that as well. That's critical. They do need to get in front of the trainer and have some clue about how these materials work, even though I do provide a lot of support in every case with every publisher that we use. So ideally, at that point, when they've met with the trainer, they have some idea, of, they've spec'd out what they want to use, and the assignments on the publisher side where you're creating the course are the assignments are made, you've identified what you want to bring over. And then the third step is to um, add that content to the LMS, organize it in modules or topics, depending on how your uh, online course is organized, and then combine it with instructor-related re material as well, creative material. Because again, rep the publisher recommendations, no matter what publisher, is as far as graded content contributing to um, the overall course grade, no more than 30 or 40% of your publisher content should contribute to the overall course grade. The rest of the material, the rest of the grade should depend on content and activities that the instructor himself or herself has developed. And then finally, consistency in communication with students is really key. If I could have the next slide, please. Thank you. So in every course for every publisher, we put a standard orientation module. And that orientation module gives them information on how to um, set up trial access, what their purchase options are, troubleshooting, who to go to for help. And this should be a consistent set of messages containing that information in, a, in the same form from course to course. So if I, I have a standard orientation module for Cengage, standard orientation module for uh, McGraw-Hill Connect, the same thing for McMillan Launchpad. Um, and then that way students, it, it should look the same as far as, again, how you set up your trial access. It Again, it's not going to be necessarily the same step depending on the publisher, but that information is key to include in that orientation module. Okay, next, uh, next slide, please. Okay. So in summary, to really ensure um, a good, uh, well, you want to eliminate the potential stumbling blocks when people use publisher materials in courses. So you want to, again, introduce, initiate the conversation between your rep, your instructor, and then you want the instructor to have access to the publisher materials through the rep. They look over the materials, they think about what, you know, what they're thinking about using, but then they need to meet with the training person. That training person, again, can be the rep, the training person could be the implementation team to really go through and assign the materials. In some cases, depending on the publisher, they will actually um, 
create tests for you. They will rearrange tests. They'll take items out that don't work for the instructor. Usually that requires a much longer timeline because that's customization on their part, but publishers typically are willing to do that. Um, the good, they're all good, but uh, it's again, the amount of resources they have at their fingertips too. And then again, the content needs to be integrated from the publisher course into your LMS. And then you need to add a resource module for uh, students to be able to become familiar in each case with what they're supposed to do to get started and the troubleshooting and the tech requirements. So kind of went through that really fast. I apologize. Anybody has any questions? We have a little bit of time left. <laughs> I think everybody's thinking like, what was she saying? <laughs> <laughs> 